Those of you who have been following along, not only here on Sunday mornings, but in your own Bible studies and going through the Gospels, it has become clear to you that this is the Passion Week. This, this is the last time Jesus will be in Jerusalem during his first coming. He is there to be the Lamb of God. These questions of his 12 apostles seem to indicate that they have finally come to grips with the idea that he is going to have to suffer at the hands of the Gentiles, that he will be crucified, buried, and in three days raised from the grave. Because they ask in their third question, Second and third question, what are the signs of your coming and the end of the age? Suggesting that they don't like the idea that he's going to die, but when are you coming back? Which is the same question we've been asking. Lord, when are you coming back? Well, he's answering our questions as well as theirs. But the point I want to reiterate is this. He, even though he is there for a specific purpose, he takes the time to patiently sit down with these people and earnestly answer their question. And instead of just shrugging it off, giving them the details to look for and to pass on to others as they disciple them, what to look for as they progress through their ministry, and ours, because he still has not come back yet, has he? Well, if he has, then uh, we got left behind. I don't think so, but nonetheless. Jesus says to them at the opening, when they're just in awe of the temple. And they should be. It was a spectacular building. It's where the hub of religious activity was for their entire lifetime. In fact, Passover was one of three required Jewish feasts by the law of Moses that they must attend. Passover, Pentecost, and tabernacle. So they're there because of the commands of Mo Moses, but they're there more importantly because they want to be in Jerusalem and worship God. So they're, they're just overwhelmed with how wonderful the temple is. And then when Jesus says it's going to be torn down and not one stone left upon the other, they don't seem to be that shocked because several of the prophets said so. Two in particular, Micah in chapter 3, verse 12, and Jeremiah chapter 26, verse 18. Listen to Micah's exact words. Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps and mountains of the houses as high places of the forest laid low. Now, a few Sundays ago, we had a guest speaker here who outlined the fulfillment of this prophecy with what he saw in Jerusalem. He saw stones still on top of each other on the Temple Mount, suggesting that perhaps that isn't where the temple was, but rather in the city of David below, because that location was at one time plowed like a field. Nothing but rubble there. And there's much conjecture in Jerusalem among Christians and Jews that it could be coming close to the time to start building the next temple. Where? So all of this plays into current events as we shall see as we continue on in Matthew but also in the coming events. 
Bear in mind that what he says in verse 36, I've said it twice before, three times, even that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now compare that to Mark, and you'll have more things to study in your small groups. Jesus is saying, look, I'm going to give you the signs, but nobody knows exactly when. Nobody. Now, what I want to draw your attention to with your Bibles open is how often the word then appears in your Bible. Verse 9. Chapter 24, verse 9. Then they will deliver you up. Verse 10. Then many false prophets. Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. And then the end will come. Verse 16. And let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Then let those. When you see the abomination, you see the connection there with verse 15. Verse 21, for then there will be great tribulation. Verse 23, then if anyone says to you, look, there's the Christ. Verse 30, then a sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Verse 40. Then two men will be in the field, and one will be taken and the other left. Verse 45. Who then is faithful and wise servant from whom his master made ruler over his household? I included the last one, even though it's not the same type of then, is it? The previous ones all point to a sequence of events. So when you're doing your Bible study, not every appearance of the word fit exactly together. Then is used by Jesus over and over again to point out this will happen, then this will happen, then this will happen. This has causes many Bible students, like yourselves perhaps, to try to put this on a graph. Then this, then this, then this, this, this. There's nothing wrong with that, but don't try to superimpose your own calendar on it. Those who have have been sorely disappointed when they try to put a date. On the back of this sermon outline, you'll see some suggested questions that you might go through as a small group. Now, that won't be what we'll try to do today after church. What we're going to try to do is just take some general questions, Paul and I, and then entertain what you might do with these questions when you get together in a home group or around your own kitchen table. One of the things you might do is compare Matthew's gospel to Luke's and Mark's that cover the same answers to the question. Matthew 24, 25, Mark 13, Luke 17, especially chapter 21. Do these differences suggest different events altogether or just a different perspective of the same events? Those are two questions you might ask yourself. Again, I want to suggest when you're reading prophetic literature like this, especially having to do with the end times, especially any study of the book of Revelation or prophetic books helping us understand, re okay, I'm just going to say it. Hinder yourself from taking somebody else's preconceived notion and over it, laying it on what the Bible actually says. Let the Bible speak to you by its power, by the Spirit who authored it, by God who ordained it to you. Now that doesn't empower you to come up with your own interpretation, but rather it says 
what do the words actually say? It is so easy just to Google. Tell me what Matthew 24 means. If you do that, you will find hundreds of thousands of interpretations. Instead of doing that, you have the best library on the planet, contains 66 books on how to interpret these passages. What does it say? The first thing Jesus says are five warnings. That's why I'm camping out on this idea. Listen to what the words say. Read them out loud. Now in a moment, moms and dads, I'm going to get to a passage that I'm not going to read out loud. And when you go to read it at your home, don't read it out loud to your kids because what you're going to read there is horrific. But let the words speak to you. Five different warnings by Jesus in the opening of these questions, answers to these questions. If one is important and two is really important, how important are five in 26 verses? Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Do not be deceived. Why is Jesus saying that? Because of all the answers you're going to find on the internet, most of which are wrong. The Bible is truth, not these would-be scholars. The Bible is truth. Verse 25. Look down in your own Bible, chapter 24. Right in the midst of these warnings, before he gives the last one, he says this, chapter 24, verse 25. See, I have told you beforehand. What is linked to that most closely? Verse 24. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive. If possible, if possible, even the elect see, I have told you beforehand. You've been warned. So in your discussion group, if you're trying to find where is the Antichrist here in this answer, this may be a clue. False Christ, Antichrist, same, similar, you decide. False prophet, where do you see that again? In the book of Revelation. Footnote, the word Antichrist is not in the book of Revelation. So you can't do a word search on that and end up in Matthew 24 or in the book of Revelation. The word Antichrist only appears in 1 and 2 John. That's it. So why do we talk about that person so much if it's only in a few verses in the Bible? Because it's important. Jesus warns of false Christ over and over and over and over and over again. Paul even talks to the church in his letters. Don't be deceived. Why is it so important? Because in one of his letters in Thessalonians, Paul says to the church, God will send a strong delusion. God will send a delusion upon those who say, I don't believe, don't care, I'm tired of listening to it, shut up. And God says, okay. Here's what you asked for. I won't talk to you about it anymore. <clears throat> Yesterday afternoon, Marsh and I took a break. Casey was helping us get the house ready for the holidays, and we were watching a movie on the rapture. It wouldn't call the rapture, but it was a Christian movie on, what's that channel? Pure Flix. Pure Flix. Interesting. In one scene, they are rolling out a large round horse trough. 
And I thought, you stole our idea. <laughs> and they fill it with water, and they are baptizing people because there's a guy standing up, and he's preaching the gospel to those who were left behind, including him. Preaching the gospel. And when people hear it, they respond, and they want to be baptized. And so he is baptizing these people in this horse trough which causes the main unbelieving character in the movie to just go ballistic and try to stop the singing and broadcasting it out on a loudspeaker because he thinks that's what's causing the things to come down from heaven, like hail, locusts, etc. He thinks that's what's causing it, these... And we're just chuckling. That's not what's causing it. It's your unbelief. What's interesting is this movie is depicting what I consider to be a biblical definition of baptism. The guy says it is not baptism that saves you. It is a confirmation of what you, God has already done on the inside. Amen? Amen? This is why we baptize. Because the Lord said to do it. He did it. In the preaching of the gospel, in the book of Acts, as they begun, almost every time there's a conversion, there was a baptism. Even Stephen and the Egyptian eunuch. Well, there's water. What hinders me to be baptized? Go back and reread that, and you realize Stephen is showing him from Isaiah <laughs> the gospel. I don't know if Isaiah mentions baptism. But nonetheless, the Spirit of God came upon this convert and he wanted to be washed clean by water and the Spirit, which is what Paul writes about, the washing and the regeneration of the Spirit. So if you haven't been baptized and you'd like to get baptized in a really nice baptistry, <laughs> join us next Sunday. We have two, we have room for more. Because... Those who have not made a decision for Jesus Christ will be in the group that are left behind. Don't be deceived by thinking, well, I'll get around to it someday. Now, every man in this room knows at our age what around to it means. I'd have no intention to ever do it. Did I say that right? I'm sorry, honey. I didn't really mean that. <laughs> Don't put it off. Do not put it off. If you have never said to God, I believe, say it today. Stop listening to me. Start talking to him. I believe. Now, that's why Jesus is saying what he's saying. Let me draw your attention to the next two verses after verse 26. See, I've told you it beforehand. Verses 27 and 28. These are words of comfort. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. And you're thinking to yourself, these are words of comfort? <laughs> yes. And I'll explain why after I read the previous verse about deception. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, his coming will be obvious Amen. to those who believe. To the rest of the world, they go, what happened? It's too late at that point. It's too late. His coming will be obvious. Like lightning that flashes to the sky, it will be obvious. When you look at that passage from the Old Testament perspective and 
the book of Revelation, you'll see now I'm starting to understand. Any study of the book of Revelation will include going through line by line, especially the letters to the seven churches. And in these letters, Jesus is telling John to write specifically to tell the churches that he is alive. He is alive and he's still in control. That's why over and over again he identifies himself by one of the titles predicted in the Old Testament. I am the beginning, the end. I am the Almighty. And on and on and on. Jesus is saying to the church, including us, I have not left you. I am here. I'm in control. All the things that are going on in the world are going to happen according to the predictions of my holy word. I'm still in control. I haven't given up. You're in my hand, and I will come and get you. Why? Because I said so, John 14. He hasn't forsaken us, so don't let anybody deceive you into thinking that he has come and you got left behind. It will be obvious. We have a little photo that we were given in our house, and it's a photo of an old country church all boarded up, and out front it says, closed, due to rapture. <laughs> the day after the rapture, I don't want to see anybody here. Wait a minute. I don't want to see anybody here. None of you. Be gone. Now, how do I know this is comforting? Because Luke repeats it. Luke chapter 17, verse 24. For just as the lightning flashes out of one part under heaven, shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. Says it twice. Jesus is trying to tell us, look, the closer it gets to his coming, the more opinions about how it's going to take place and what the signs really are will float around the church. On the internet, and elsewhere. Don't be deceived by them. I'm telling you in advance. Now with regard to verse 28. Listen up, mom and dad. You need to be careful about how you do this at home. For wherever the carcass is, their eagles will be gathered together. Now from Luke's account, 1737. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? Where will this happen? So he said, wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Now some translations have the word vulture, which is fine. The Greek word is actually the word for eagle. But some interpreters don't think eagles attack carrion. They do. Any of us who have been out hunting know that the eagles will come to uh, what we leave behind and they will enjoy. In fact, I have seen a bald eagle fight vultures off the carcass. So Jesus is saying plainly, when that time comes, look for the eagles, look for the vultures. Where they're feeding, that's where the destruction has happened. This is backed up by scriptures in the Old Testament. And when you look in your reference Bible or you do your own study, you'll see where Ezekiel and others talk about this. And they are even more explicit than Jesus is with regard to what is going on during the judgment of those who reject Jesus. When are you coming? There are two Greek words translated coming in the New Testament. In Thessalonians, Paul uses the word parousia, translated coming. 
That word does not appear in Revelation the many times Jesus says, I am coming. He uses a different Greek word for coming, or chong. The difference is this, even though they both can be accurately translated coming. Perusia has the idea of arrival, presence. That's why Paul uses that word. When he comes, arrives, is here, dwelling upon us. You shall know it. Jesus is affirming to John and to the churches, I'm on my way. I'm coming. I have not forgotten. That's the difference in the two words. And you know it without me explaining that when somebody says, I'm on my way, I'm coming. And when they mean, eh, I'm leaving sometime, I'll be there when I get there. Now, only those who are in Christ will be alive when he comes for his church. Excuse me, I said that wrong. Only those in Christ will be taken, will be spiritually alive, and he will take them as the church. The church are not those who attend church. The church are those who are born again in Christ. That's the church. Know that. Believe it. Understand it. Just because you've been the member of a church doesn't make you a born again believer in Christ. Know the difference. Know what your Bible actually says. Verse 24, and then the end will come. When these events start lining up, when you see this and this happens and this happens, and then the end will come. He's talking about the end of the age. He's telling us what to look for. He's using all kinds of signs that are explained in the Old Testament. Signs about stars and falling from the sky and moon turning black and all these cosmic things happening, Jesus is talking about. John sees them in visions when the seals are open. He sees them actually happening. Because you're a student of Scripture, you know that that's already been predicted by the prophets. Daniel, Ezekiel, and others have already told us what's going to happen. Why? Because Jesus, God in Jesus declared the end from the beginning. He's been telling us all along. What's going to be happening? Why? So that you won't be deceived by those who come, come along and say, well, this is how it's really going to take place. Unless you're a member of our church, you ain't going, really. Unless you're a member of the church, you're not going, is a true statement, but not the other one. Now, moms, dads, the passage I've been referring to now for the third time is Ezekiel 39. 17 through 20. When you read that, read it to yourself. Ezekiel's going to describe these end time events very graphically. Unless you want to nurse some nightmares with your kids, don't read this out loud. There's a parts of the Bible that are meant for adults only. This is one of those passages. But Ezekiel tells you like it's going to be. That was one of the observations the three of us had with that movie. As bad as they tried to depict it in this movie, it's going to be a whole lot worse. A whole lot worse. Hundreds of thousands of people will perish. Thousands. That grieves my heart. Thousands upon thousands of people will have said, even in the end, I don't believe it. Even when it's happening right in front of them, and somebody is showing them in the Bible, see? Eh, that's not what this is. The person that said, see, goes, dies. 
taken. One of the things this movie did right was it showed the difference between people who die in their raptured state. One of the pastors left behind said, they didn't die, they were taken. And the unbeliever went, eh? They were taken. I want you to be one of the ones taken. When he comes from the church, go with him. When you hear his voice calling you, say, yes, sir. Here I am, Father. In fact, you may not even get a chance to even say anything. Poof, gone. Poof, gone, twinkling of an eye. When you search the scriptures, you will see that Matthew, Mark, and Luke have differences. They have a lot of similarities, but they also have differences. I want you to embrace that and look at them for what they are and find out why there are differences. And some of you are thinking, well, I already understand part of the difference. Why would he need four Gospels if it's all about the same good news of Jesus Christ? Because God's smarter than us and knows that some of us need to be told at least four times. Well, some of us more than four. We want our kids to hear it once. When you have in your possession a really good reference Bible, and I hope you own one, if you don't, go find one and buy it. Whatever version you choose is fine with me. There's, well, there's only one I really don't like. But if you have a good Bible that you understand, whether King James or otherwise, get one that has references, where it shows you where that word or phrase or concept appears somewhere else in the Bible. Some of them have at the end of the verse, some of them at the end of the paragraph, some of them have in the center column, Whatever you prefer, buy it. Use it. And when you do, you will see, I've just written down a few from my reference Bible with regard to verse 29. Let's look at it first, and then I'll show you what I mean. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. You see it? Now, if you go to the, a reference in your Bible, it'll show you in the Old Testament where some of those events have been predicted. So you've been given a clue to how to interpret those signs. I'll read it again. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the Bible will explain that. The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. And you will have a wonderful Bible study when you do that. Because you'll be able to figure out from Isaiah 13, Ezekiel 32, Joel 2, Joel 2.20, Joel 2.31, and Joel 3.15, what those mean. I hope I put them in your notes. If not, let me read them again so you can write them down. You don't need to. They're in your Bible. Read it. You'll find out. Regarding the powers of heaven, what is that? I'm glad you asked. Isaiah 34, Ezekiel 32, Joel 2, Haggai 2, and Haggai 2.21 will explain what the powers of heavens are. It's in the Bible. So you don't need to go anywhere else. You have it in your lap. Well, I hope you have it in your lap, at home at least. Verse 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then the tribes of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. What does that mean? Daniel chapter 7. Verse 11 through 14 will tell you exactly what that means. Well, what about verse 31, chapter 24? 
and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. How do I interpret that? I'm glad you asked. Look at the Bible. It will tell you. It's in Zechariah, and it's in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 30, verse 4, and Zechariah 2, verse 10. It tells you exactly what's coming down the pike. You've been told. And Jesus is just telling his disciples, stay calm. If you'd already searched the scriptures, I wouldn't need to be answering this question, but that's okay. I understand you don't fully comprehend what's going to happen this week, but I am going to suffer at the hands of the Gentiles. When we get to those passages of his crucifixion, they are cruel. The Jewish leaders of his time are screaming for him to be crucified. The Roman government doesn't know what to do. So they offer up Barabbas. And they go, no, nah, let him go. Crucify him. They're done with him. All a part of God's plan. That he would die this horrific death on the cross as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was all predicted. Now, verses 36 through 34 I won't have time to go through it line by line, but you do have the time. But in the day or hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of Son of Man be. You notice how he ties it together? You don't know the day and hour, so be ready. But here's a hint. As it was in the days of Noah, verse 38, for isn't the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. There's a huge hint. That's why this movie chose a wedding to show his coming as it was in the days of Noah. Then two men, then women, Watch, therefore, you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. He says it again, verse 42. Be ready. If, you, if that's not enough for you, verse 44. Therefore, you also be ready. Now look at your own Bible. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. What is our Lord saying? You can study these signs as long as you want. You can figure them out as clearly as you want to present it to somebody else. But I'm telling you in advance, I'm coming when you don't expect it. That's sobering. Be ready. The only way to be ready is to know for sure in whom you believe. That you are in Christ and he is in you. That's the only way to be ready. That's the only way. So as it was in the day of Noah, and then Luke includes the days of Lot. So there's another study as a clue as to what it's going to be like. But the one thing I want you to leave here today with is this. Jesus says, I am coming back in an hour you don't expect.